Dan O'Brien, who, good to go? Good to go. Thank you, thanks for, uh, for coming. I think this will be about 40 minutes so no one will be late for long games. <laughs> You'll get to, to cornhole and uh, all those great games. Um, just wanted to thank uh, Leah and Gwen and Adam and the staff. Um, it's, it's very moving to be back here, obviously, after the last year and a half, and it's kind of um, miraculous to me that the conference is running so smoothly and, and everything seems so chill and calm and um, knock on wood. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm impressed and grateful and I feel lucky, lucky to be here. Um, this is, um, you know, I, I admire greatly uh, people who can lecture extemporaneously. I, I can't, so I'm not going to do that to you. Uh, and I wrote, uh, wrote something, which I've been doing for the last uh, four years here, just trying to take a, a different element of playwriting craft and trying to relate it to, uh, to memoir, to my life, why I write the way I write um, now. Uh, I, I'm sort of allergic to what I think is called the imperative mood. Is that right? Where you telling people what to do, and I don't really like to do that, so I'm going to try not to. Um, this probably needs a subtitle, but I'm calling it Second Act Problems. And during the pandemic, overnight, I suddenly needed reading glasses, so I'm going to use these um, unfamiliar things. Second Act Problems. If you have survived cancer, if you have survived anything, including COVID-19, you are intimately familiar with the problem of second acts. You question why you are here when others are not. You worry that the crisis is not past, but lying in wait, ready to recur. You find yourself attempting to master your trauma in memory and in writing, thereby paradoxically fanning its flames. You wonder, as playwrights often wonder as they pause upon the plateau of a competently written first act, what can and should and must come next. The middle, you see, is a muddle. During my treatment for stage four colon cancer in 2016, an ordeal that commenced on the day my wife concluded her treatment for stage two breast cancer, I wanted nothing more than to get back to normal. The day-to-dayness of a husband and new father, a mid-career playwright and poet. At the same time, I wanted desperately to revise my life fundamentally, irrevocably, should I recover, to quote, burn it all down, any and all aspects of my life before cancer that had failed to bring me enough health and joy. I devised innumerable plans for reconceiving my career, my relationships, my psychology. I envisioned a better life, better than normal. You could say I wish to move backward and forward at once, back to the relative safety of the past and ahead toward a post-traumatic reinvention of self. In other words, I was conflicted. Yet conflict can be creative, as every playwright knows. It heats and hammers and forges, if we are lucky, a new life. A little product placement. <laughs> to speak of second acts is to speak of acts or action, which is what happens. Dramatic action can be conceptualized as some combustible mixture of a play's setting, relationships, and conflicts. These terms are largely self-evident, but a few elaborations. Setting isn't merely the literal location of a play, but its context and subtext and history and society. Relationship doesn't refer only to whom and what these characters are to one another, but to their shared intimacy, the love or friendship imperiled by the play. And in turn, conflict is entwined with relationship because struggle without interpersonal risk tends to leave an audience cold. Combine these three elements and theoretically, a story will happen. How you choose to organize what happens is your structure. Dramatic structure then is the shape of what happens. Some other fundamentals, uh, acts run anywhere from 20 to 60 minutes. Anything shorter belongs in the subgenres of the short play or 10 minute play. An act may contain a handful of or numerous scenes clearly numbered in the script, each set in a different time and or place. Or an act can be composed of many so-called French scenes, 
in which time and place is stable while characters come and go, each new configuration of personae constituting a new scene. These French scenes are never numbered. An act may be one long scene. Dramaturgically speaking, an act is a unit of action in which characters are propelled and compelled from a point of calm through a phase of rising action, more on that later, to some climactic shift in circumstance, what Chekhov called with vaudevillian panache, the punch on the nose. A plot twist then is a sucker punch. A playwright's biggest punch is the knockout that effectively ends the play. Modern American playwrights have, by and large, abandoned Acts 3, 4, 5, blaming on Shakespeare, Shaw, Chekhov, or the Pavlovian conditioning of TV and film, not to mention the economics of theater making. We don't like long plays very much. So when I speak of second acts, I mean what happens after intermission or absent an intermission uh, or absent an interval in the play's second half. A three-act structure is often present in a modern play anyway, as if submerged or camouflaged, in that its first half typically contains two major movements of action, running about an hour altogether, sometimes more, while the play's second half, in reality its third act, races down the home stretch in 30 or 40 minutes. Nowadays, many if not most new plays are intermissionless affairs, but the audience still absorbs, if you will, the contours of a, be of a beginning, middle and end over the course of the play's seemingly required 95 minutes. This three-act structure can be traced back to Aristotle, but it's a notion vague enough to be common in most cultures under the sun. There's comedy in the rule of threes, two for expectation, three for surprise. In folklore and myth, there are wishes and suitors, pigs and bears and bowls of porridge. In biology, it's the pairing that produces a resulting and concluding third. Aristotelian structure remains relevant today insofar as a new play makes use of the three unities, that, that of time, place, and action, the magic of threes again. Regarding time, an, an Aristotelian play never leaps forward or, heaven forbid, flashes back. No blackouts or jump cuts. Plot is, a plot is the events of a, play, of a play in sequence, and in a classical play, these events are compressed, action is accelerated, Coincidence and contrivance are appreciated and admired. An Aristotelian play stays put. This is the unity of place. No shifts in location, no meanwhile elsewhere. The setting is more often than not a public or semi-public place. The palace steps, the dark enchanted woods, in order to accommodate a commotion of character and incident. As for unified action, everything that happens in the Aristotelian play contributes to the conflict of protagonist and antagonist. No tangential or superfluous events intrude to distract. The play contains itself. The function of the unities, then as now, is to shrink the distance between audience and character, to unify our private stories with the collectively imagined one. An Aristotelian play attempts a kind of pressurized, enforced empathy. We are in this together, here and now. The unities are often present in modern plays, though usually not all three at once. Because it's cheap, a unit set has long been popular with producers and therefore playwrights. While these stories may play out over days or months or years, the setting is a living room or kitchen. Palace steps and enchanted woods have been for some time now replaced by sofas and kitchen sinks. The idea of catharsis is Aristotle's too, of course, another antique criterion that still matters. Most playwrights are aiming, consciously or not, for a climax of catharsis when a character or characters experience, along with the audience, the joy and terror of transformation. Play structure is act structure, is scene structure. Like fractal patterns in nature, a play's shape is reiterated within its acts, scenes, and significant beats. I know a much louded director who swears up and down the theater bar that the first page of every great play contains, like a seed, like the golden ratio, the structure of the play as a whole. 
This rudimentary structure is recognizable as the line graph we recall with horror, with humor from high school, though these days it may remind us more of COVID-19 infections and deaths. In both the scientific and the dramatic, the x-axis is time, but in the play, our y is danger. The line itself is conflict. There are phases of progress. The curtain rises on the status quo, an enactment of what's normal in your characters' lives. Exposition is forgiven here. All manner of tensions ripple the surface, but the play hasn't properly begun. This status quo may last five minutes or 15, though modern playwrights tend to sketch the everyday, even to allude to it without depicting it while confronting straight away the problem of the play. This true beginning, whenever it occurs, is the inciting incident, something a character says or does, or a crisis imposed from without that sets the play's clock ticking. As Robert McKee defines it in story, his influential, if Byzantine, how-to for dramatic writers, the inciting incident casts the protagonist's life into disarray. And the narrative that unfolds is the play-by-play -play of their attempt to, quote, get back to normal, even or perhaps ideally to discover and achieve a new normal, a new life. After the story's launched, we follow a trajectory referred to regrettably as rising action, regrettable because it makes me think of bread baking and Viagra. But rising, <laughs> sorry, it's a, cheap, it's a cheap joke, but I had to get in there. But rising surely refers to heart rate and blood pressure and horripilation in the audience as the play's conflict complicates and intensifies. Despite variation in pace and tone from scene to scene, a traditionally structured play rarely retreats from danger to safety. Eventually, again, a bit too comically, sexually, we reach climax. Many have noted with a wink and a critique the maleness of the single climax structure. But even traditionally structured plays have many climaxes along the way. In a scene, a climactic beat is often referred to as an event. Conflict between characters has wrought a change, a noteworthy development that establishes a new status quo for the increasingly dangerous conflict ahead. After the play's final climax, that knockout punch, remember, a period of falling action ensues. A scene or scenes in which themes and plot lines are tied up neatly with eloquent summations and lessons learned, etc. This resolution or denouement is in its way yet another status quo, which is why endings are also beginnings. The well-made play is the invention of a 19th century French playwright with the improbable name of Eugène Scribe, or Eugene Scribe, if you're American. Long ago, I donned a powdered wig and a pair of pea green tights for his five-act comedy, The Glass of Water. Typecast once again, I was Lord Bolingbroke, and my cane work was exquisite. Scribe wrote some 400 of these so-called 400 of these so-called well-made plays concerned with seductions and affairs and financial intrigue. His twists and reversals turned upon objects like purloined letters, or in my case, the titular glass of water. His plays are more or less interchangeable and forgettable today, but they were fantastically popular. They made money. And in order to make more money, the characteristics of these plays were codified and expected in new dramatic works. I won't summarize in detail. Wikipedia is here for you, for all of us. But the well-made play is with us still, and the concept of dramatic structure as a mold or vessel into which the playwright pours their plays slurry of character and plot and theme. This is very much how TV and screenwriting is approached. Genre is infinitely more constricted than playwriting. Screen and TV writers aren't even allowed to choose their own font, for goodness sake. <laughs> Call it commercial, mainstream, or accessible theater, the modern well-made play is, like its predecessor, predecessor, a closed system. These plays are naturalistic, that is, they create the illusion of reality. There's often only one protagonist, and the plot concerns itself primarily with relational conflicts. As with the Aristotelian play, nothing is extraneous. Anything and anyone introduced is grist for the action. Scenes and acts escalate. Endings are unambiguous and score psychological and political points. This is, in broad strokes, the modern mainstream model of dramatic structure. The many playwrights 
feel they are working with or against or apart from, and it is undeniably a structure that often conveys capitalistic, paternalistic, and racist values and beliefs. All that relentless drive toward a single game over climax, the privileged white male hero engaged in his project of prevailing. I'm not suggesting that you write this kind of play, far from it, but more of my backtracking after a break. Got to combat the, the dry mouth sounds. Okay, here we go. I'm thinking about structure, in particular second acts, for personal reasons. I am middle-aged, you may be surprised to learn. I came to, I came to Sewanee when I was young. I celebrated my 30th birthday on Wiggins Creek Drive, around the corner from the horse farm, if you've made it out that way yet. I wrote a play here that I appended with an epigraph from James Joyce's last gasp of a love poem, Giacomo Joyce, quote, youth has an end. The end is here. It will never be. You know that well. What then? Write it, damn you. Write it. What else are you good for? It's funny to me now that I felt so old then. Middle age is the height of uncertainty. Gone are the quasi-delusional convictions of youth. At the same time, one is yet to achieve the resignation, the liberating acceptance and grace of an older age. Wisdom is coming, right? As we all know, American lives are supposed to lack second acts. We are obsessed with youth. We consume and rapidly dispose of everything, including art and culture. Yet most of us will live through a second act, to say nothing of a third, fourth, fifth, how we structure the acts of our lives is up to us, and we do it all the time, perpetually revising our memories and our plans. I don't remember ever feeling exactly young, clueless and powerless, sure, but as a child, I already felt old, old soul, old people would remark, glimpsing something in my glance before turning away warily, perhaps pityingly. Probably some part of me was old already because trauma was aging me rapidly in a family rife with untreated mental illness, verbal and emotional abuse, secrecy and lies. You could say I was prematurely mature while remaining younger than my peers in numerous ways because trauma kept me locked within a structure of introspection and vigilance. My precociousness allowed me to write plays that struck some audiences as discordantly insightful for my age. But I knew, some of them knew too, that I was at least faking it. As I grew older, I had trouble accepted, accepting that I was leaving the town and the valley for the dark woods of midlife. I still have trouble accepting it because routinely I feel 12 years old again, still the age at which I witnessed my brother's suicide attempt when he leapt from a window in our attic. Or younger, maybe three years old in moments of joy and rage and wonder, pure presence. Most of the time, I'm probably around 30 or whenever it was that I first hit my stride as that universal prosaic type, the adult. Maybe you feel similarly but then the years flip past, you're changing incrementally in temperament and bodily, shuddering through the bumps and scrapes of careers, the complexities and negotiations of intimacy and family, until inevitably you collide with some unmovable object, an accident. You or a loved one falls ill. War or pandemic erupts. And interrupted, we are devastated, dislodged from the well-made structure of the life we believed we were living. And we are astonished, panicked, to find ourselves lost in that dark wood, having wandered from the straight path, or jettisoned from the path, like my wife and me, the path itself obliterated, left staggering through a blasted no man's land. In the middle of drafting this lecture, I took a few days for my regularly, regularly scheduled CT scan. As I write this, I'm awaiting the results. I'm approaching my fifth year since finishing treatment. My oncologist uses the term permanent remission or even cure if somebody like me survives 10 years without a recurrence of the cancer. So 10 years is my life or death objective, and I'm roughly halfway there. 
I'm in the middle in so many ways. The second half of this lecture remains to be written. There are plays to finish, poems to revise, books to publish and sweatily self-promote. I have a seven-year-old daughter to raise. I'm not, I'm determined to do everything in my power such as it is to shield her from the trauma I knew as a child. I am in no way finished with my story, but I'm not the ultimate author of my life, of course. The results of this scan may not make sense, structurally speaking. It may transform my private drama, my comedy even, on good days, back into the tragedy it seemed to be five years ago, or into something worse, a story without meaning. But sooner or later, the call comes. Late in the day, as I'm out for a run in the Southern California sun, I lower my mask. I stop and stand, stealing the quaver in my voice, hello? The results, the nurse says, are normal. The scan is clear. I now have another year before another reckoning. I have found my feet again, or I have been allowed by what, by whom, to find the path, a new path, not the path I was following before cancer, lit up again with the purpose of my second act. I resume my run. Now let me apologize for all that talk of Aristotle and powdered wigs and traditionally structured drama. I don't write plays that way, or not exclusively. I received my master's degree in a program where the concept of structure was almost taboo, and I, I wanted that. I agreed. I was at a lecture once where the playwright Mac Wellman was fielding a graduate student's gotcha question. The question was, how do you define dramatic structure? And Mac paused for dramatic effect. Dramatic structure, he said, is that way in which your play resembles an older and better play. <laughs> it's a classic. Um, our philosophy then, in a nutshell, was that mainstream models of structure are derivative, constrictive, even deceitful, implicitly biased, and often just plain boring. The playwrights we admired were Adrian Kennedy, Carol Churchill, Maria Irene Fornes, not to mention our mentors Paula Vogel, Aisha Rahman, Charles Mee, writers who subverted form and created their own forms altogether. Mee, in particular, I found fascinating in his comparison of the innovative structure of his plays to the form his body took after the trauma of childhood polio. I thought of myself at 23 as an experimental playwright or a formerly challenging one at least, I wanted to tell stories the way I wanted to tell them, not out of hubris necessarily, but in pursuit of verisimilitude. If the most dramatic passages in our lives are tumultuous, disordering, confusing, how can a truthful play tell a straightforward story? Then, as now, we had political objections too. Cognitive structures are inherited and often exploitative. In dramaturgical terms, a play's structure aims to exploit resources of attention and emotion. As with structures of law, of policing, so it is with arts organizations. The structure of a nonprofit theater, its artistic staff, board, members, all but dictates which plays and musicals are produced. Values expressed and encoded in these works are sanctioned by this literal platforming. Most of us are skeptical of structural power of every kind, so why should we not question, deviate from, or reject the tenets and prescriptions of the modern well-made play? Here are some characteristics of plays often written in reaction as resistance or rebellion that break from tradition. Some describe these plays as deconstructed, but I like the sound of the unwell-made play suggesting a theatrical manifestation of a sickening society, or better yet, the unmade play, like plans that are scrapped, an individual undone by circumstance, a bed in disarray but warm with life. The unmade play may appear at first glance to be a mess, but its structure is inventive and idiosyncratic. Time and place is malleable, if not fluid. Plot does not progress in a linear fashion. Both formally and thematically, these plays provoke, comforting some, but ideally, discomforting others. Characters and their concerns are not predominantly upper caste characters and concerns. These unmade characters don't change, or not much, or they change a lot, but not for the usual reductive reasons. Perhaps there is no protagonist, 
Internal conflict takes focus. Random events occur, wreak havoc, or change nothing at all. Coincidence is ironically permissible. A plot's power may accrue laterally and by repetition and resonance, or an interrogation and an elucidation of style and theme may supplant plot as the point of the play altogether. The unmade play is short. The unmade play is long. Endings are open and that mysteries remain unsolved. There is no catharsis. The idea is Brecht's because a climactic purgation of repressed emotion feels nice, but it lets us off the hook. The unmade play instead spurs its audience into actual action, inspiring us to engage with the drama in our lives and communities. The point of the unmade play is to question, what do you make of this? What will you do now? Who are you and why and how will you change? I think like Mike Pence, I may have just swallowed a fly, so I'm gonna... <laughs> At least you won't bother me anymore. Wow. That's my first Sewanee fly. I usually, it's usually when I'm out running in the woods, I swallow a few, but wow, this is the first. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Uh, new section. I am by nature skeptical, or maybe it's nurture's fault, having been raised in a house where our behavior was harshly regulated for inscrutable, if not pathological, reasons. As a child, I suspected every rule was an unjust attempt to control me. My skepticism toward received forms of dramatic structure is also no doubt related to my obsessive compulsive disorder, which blossomed in my adolescence in the spring after my brother's suicide attempt. Many of my obsessions had to do with form, I arranged objects in my bedroom, for instance, in superstitiously significant, often symmetrical patterns, pens on my desk, pins in, my lamp, in a lampshade, a postcard from Sunday school listing in order the books of the Bible had to be placed on my nightstand leaning upright just so, and if, God forbid, a careless turn or wayward draft sent it fluttering to the carpet, Below, I would snatch it up immediately and replace it with grinding consternation, just, just so, then kneel and lace my hands and pray for forgiveness. And the prayers themselves were intricately structured by me and repetitive. It was exhausting. But even in the throes of my distress, I knew that my beliefs and behaviors were ludicrous <coughs> and arbitrary. The structures I was endeavoring to impose upon myself and my environment would have no effect on the disaster I was subconsciously dreading, a second suicide attempt that would succeed. Yet I went on organizing my life in this way because I was conjuring for myself the illusion of safety. It was not long after I developed OCD that I began to scribble in a notebook, and I was amazed to find that when I let myself write freely and honesty, Honestly, that is dangerously, my symptoms eased. Writing without rules was showing me the way, the straight path, it seemed to me then, toward freedom and health. In graduate school, however, many of the freest, least rule-bound plays I was reading and seeing and writing didn't make much sense or not enough sense to me. They evaded or deflated the cliches of experience, yes, but was that enough? The playwrights seemed to be hiding in the play. I couldn't figure out why this story mattered to them, to say nothing of why it mattered to the characters, if these actor automatons could rightly be called characters. Another slogan among my co cohort, uh, character is dead whatever that meant. These plays flattered my intellect sometimes, but they rarely roused my empathy. I felt left out. And my alienation seemed to prove that there had been a failure of the theatrical con compact, and that a play should be as natural as conversation, albeit a temporarily one-sided conversation. Secretly, I began to feel like the Neil Simon of the department. I had recently returned from a wander yard in Ireland where I had been studying, informally and frequently drunkenly with oral storytellers. Despite my proclivity for inventive and idiosyncratic storytelling, I wanted my plays to communicate, to connect. Remember, I was still the child who felt he could only speak through poems, stories, plays. I hungered to be heard.
So I decided that I would give the traditional another and ongoing appraisal. As the young feel they are inventing love and sex, they are. As the middle-aged are inventing divorce and death, I believed I was inventing for myself the craft of playwriting. I still feel that way. There are many reasons why a playwright may wish to employ or borrow from received notions of dramatic structure. As a result of history's trial and error, these models are sturdy and reliable. You're not wasting your one wild and precious life laboring to reinvent the wheel. You are giving the audience what they want, and why not? What have you got against them? You comfort the audience by meeting most of their expectations. They are primed for the familiar while anticipating subtle yet meaningful deviations. You stand a better chance of reaching a wider audience with your modern well-made play produced at large regional theaters, often maybe on Broadway, thereby fostering opportunities in TV and film. You may even end up earning a living. Writing within well-made confines doesn't have to be solely or predominantly about comforting the audience. The elegance of traditional forms can elevate horrifying subject matter and focus overwhelming material into a cogent, dramatic thesis. Historical and political plays offering solutions and indictments can benefit from these clarifying forms. I know what I'm doing isn't new. Like most writers, I'm attempting to make the old new again. I place myself in the middle and I synthesize. I write out of a creative tension, a constructive conflict within myself between reaching the audience and expressing my idiosyncratic self. My hope is that the unfamiliar in my play will shake the audience awake and in this way affect them more deeply than the play they were drowsily expecting. No matter your approach, the question remains, why are second acts so hard to write? Because it's easier to make a mistake than to make amends. Because possibilities are generative, whereas resolutions reduce and exclude. Playwrights know that act two pivots upon the climax of the preceding act. We find our new bearings in a more complicated struggle and an enlargement and entanglement of the original predicament and proceed hazardously from there. Our most common error is a second act that suffers from sameness, not enough pivot, too much continuity. The audience by now knows too well the rules of the game, of the play, and they disengage. Or in a related sense, our second act circles round and retraces the trajectory of our first act, producing a story that's too controlled and therefore contrived. Another mistake is to hurdle ahead with the abandon of our first act's exploration and to lose our plot like Ahab in the, quote, unsured, harborless immensities. A second act insufficiently related to its first act will abandon the audience and dispel their empathy. The challenge of the second act, as I've come to see it, is to yield to the play that your play is becoming. We allow act one's crisis, catastrophe, revolution, what have you, to alter the structure of the play drastically, if required. Ideally, we accept that the writing of Act One has changed the playwright, our premeditated design for the play, but also perhaps our preconceptions about ourselves. And for this reason, the play we finished is not the play we set out to write. This is how it has been in my life. I feel continuity with who I was and what I was doing before cancer, but I'm also shockingly changed. It's, if my life's second act began the afternoon I was unho unhooked from my final dose of fluorocil, then my objective these last five years, not only to persist, but to remake myself, to invent a new self who is surviving this particular calamity, has drawn me into many unforeseen conflicts, the conflict of keeping calm, of pursuing and enjoying joy, of creating the conditions for optimism, as well as more practical conflicts like how will, one, how will my marriage mature? How will my writing communicate now and for what reasons? My overarching objective now is to make meaning out of what my wife and I have been through so that I might feel that our suffering is worth something, not commercially speaking, certainly, but another kind of worth I don't have the words for. For more than a year now, furloughed, forgotten, exiled in a state of suspension, 
Theater artists have ruminated and reflected in a multitude of structural sins that, may, that we may have tolerated previously are now rightly considered appalling. We have wanted to work. We have missed the camaraderie of rehearsals and the dark, sealed container of a theater crowded with warm and breathing bodies, unmasked breathing bodies, caught together in the spell of a communal imagining. Yet we are hungering for, we are demanding an industry transformed a theater culture worthy of our dedication. The Trump era flared out in a one act of stupidity and, car and carnage. With vaccines and theaters reopening indoors, we are all now wading into a morass of unwritten potential. Will the theater regress out of habit or tradition? Fear and the assumption of economic necessity, a shameful dud of a drama if it happens, or will we strive toward new structures and the new health that in our convalescence we imagined? The stakes could not be higher. The art form has been hemorrhaging talent to other genres, other livelihoods. If we fail to achieve something like herd immunity here in the US, or failing that, a low enough incidence of infection, won't partially filled theaters only foster an even more elite audience due to higher ticket prices and pre-show prerequisites like tech-based vaccine passports? Won't producers feel the need to provide these privileged audiences with even more cautious fare, revivals and classics, and new plays and musicals that affirm rather than confront the audience's complacencies and prejudices? Prejudices. I fear the dismay, the malaise that will descend if our lives in the theater go back to normal. Not improved, not better, not burned away, purged and reborn, but merely resumed. Or will things be worse than before? Because after trauma, there often arises an equal and opposite urge to pretend that nothing much has really happened, to quarantine our pain, to cordon disaster in a corner of our subconscious and forget, or to try to forget as repressed emotion inevitably finds its expression elsewhere, usually in destructive if not psychotic fashion. Our dreams of massive institutional metamorphosis may indeed seem to evaporate at first because it was a dream. Change that happens fast is one of our most cherished dramaturgical fantasies. The task of our post-pandemic second act, if you will, is to take action and because it will take time, hold fast to the hard-won insights of 2020 when our object objectives are clarified and amplified. Theaters need diverse leadership and staff. Plays and musicals must enact the stories of the population at large, not solely those of the theater's usual wealthy patrons and corporate donors. Artists deserve something even remotely approaching a living wage. The list goes on. What is possible now, what has been uh, already occurring, is the creation of accessible theater presentive inventively. Streaming production should continue for those who cannot afford the journey or the price of admission. Much has been and will continue to be staged outdoors and in unconventional settings. Many artists have little left to lose, so they are taking risks. We may be witnessing the reemergence of a truly nonprofit theater. That said, a demotic grassroots movement does nothing to rectify the economic exploitation of artists, but it may cultivate more pertinent storytelling and a genuinely popular theater in the years ahead. As mentioned earlier, during the depredations and isolation of my cancer treatment, I wondered if I wanted to keep writing at all, if writing had ever really been a choice to begin with. I could make that choice now, I reasoned. I could shut up. Why I could write simply for myself, for my desk drawer, and find another career. This might have been my version of burning it all down, but I am stubborn and I remembered why I wrote my first play. So I chose to return in my recovery to the wellspring of my passion. I would write only what I wanted to write, what I needed to write. Now with all the forthrightness and candor I could muster, I would be because I had to be less afraid, because I had lived beside the abyss of meaninglessness and loss as we've all been living since March of last year. I would not abandon my art, but seek to change it, to challenge and change it. I would trust as I trust now that my second act, as long as it lasts, as long as it takes, will lead to a better life in the theater.
I was going to end there with that punch on the nose, a real, a real world application of artistic introspection, as is my habit, a structure I've grown too accustomed to, but I'd rather conclude in a classical mode. We are unified here in this place, in the theater, in this time now, the summer of 2021, we are surviving. We are lucky to be here. We are told that we have gone back to normal or getting there. Our status quo re regained. We are post COVID or getting there, getting there perhaps. We are cancer free or that's the hope anyway. I can't help but recall my return to Suwannee in 2017 when I was confused and terrified and astonished. I was grieving and rejoicing, rejoicing and grieving all at once. But on the whole, joy was winning and leading me forward, helping me find my way and tell my story. So I feel that now with you. I feel it keenly because in a theater we are never alone. We are in this together. Thank you. Thank you.